and thank you so much for coming to the Docklands Documentary Film Festival. It's wonderful to see a full theater, um, especially for this um, amazing film, Victim Suspect. We're so thrilled to be able to um, have it as part of the festival this year. Just a few quick announcements before we get started. Um, I'd like to uh, give a special thank you to our sponsor of this film, T. Wolf, and also to all of our sponsors, donors, and supporters. We really couldn't do it without you. So thank you so much. Yeah. Um, this film is eligible for the Audience Award, and you should have received a ballot on your way into the theater. Um, you can give it to uh, the house managers on your way out. You just tear the number five is you loved the film one, maybe not so much for you, but, um, and they'll be collecting those after, after the performance. Um, I'd like to remind you now to please turn off any electronic devices, anything that might make noise during the screening, and um, to please stay for an amazing Q&A after the film. Um, we have some of the protagonists from the film um, with us today. And I'd like to bring up now uh, Ray DeLeon, who is one of the producers and the uh, amazing uh, protagonist reporter um, of the film. She'll be introduced more depth afterwards, but she'd like to say a few words. Thank you, Ray. Thank you. Hi everyone, what a lovely, warm, intimate screening this is. I'm so excited. Um, thank you so much each and every one of you for coming. It means a lot to me. This is sort of like our hometown um, premiere because uh, I work at the Center for Investigative Reporting, which we used to be based in the East Bay. Um, and so I did most of my work in the East Bay and I live in Oakland and I'm so happy to be here. Um, this is a film that was made with a lot of heart, a lot of outrage, anger, passion. Um, and I'm very, very excited for you all to watch it. And I hope that it resonates deeply with you. And I will be here after for the Q and A. So I hope you can stay. Um, so please enjoy the film. Welcome to the stage, Amanda Pike, Director of TV and Documentaries at the Center for Investigative Reporting. Thank you. And I will introduce a woman who needs no introduction after you've seen the film, Ray DeLeon. Uh, Ray, Ray and I will talk for a little bit and then we'll open questions up to the audience. So uh, as you probably know now, Ray is a reporter and producer at the Center for Investigative Reporting. We've worked together for about eight years there. She, her, she first started out as an intern in 2013, then came back in 2015 as an associate producer, worked her way up through the ranks. And then this was her first solo investigation. Um, and now it's on Netflix, no pressure. <laughs> um, so, so much we can talk about and so much we've been talking about. We've been working on this film together for five years. Um, you know, one of the things that struck me, it was a highlight of the film, was your interview with Detective Cotto. Um, and I know we talked the night before that interview and you were really nervous that he was going to walk out or shut down or, you know, it wouldn't happen. Uh, but you can't tell because in the film you're completely unflappable and just look completely in charge of that interview. Can you talk a little bit about how that came about and um, what you were thinking as it was going on? I had, I had tried several times with emails and texts to, to talk to him. And then um, I don't know if it was the Netflix appeal or what, but he agreed this time. Um, and so I I just remember, you know, I was really worried that, it, you know, he was only going to give us a half an hour. And I was like, oh, how are we going to get through this? And so he gave us we sat with him for several hours, like four hours, um, because he, you know, he, he talks, he, he could talk. Um, and I was very grateful that he did. Uh, yeah, I, I was, 
I was like sitting in the car and the crew was setting up. And so I was going to come in, like it all kind of felt like there was a lot of pressure and I was going to come in and say hello. And I didn't know if he was going to recognize me and, you know, I don't know if he did still, but yeah, he sat, he, he was very proud of his methods. So I was, I learned a lot. It was very illuminating. Uh, one of the, there was so much that didn't make the 90 minute cut of the film, as you can imagine, especially after five years. One of, one of the cases, so the case that Detective Cotto worked on, the Nikki Ovino case, and she's the one you see her briefly, I think, where he says, you know, puts his hand on her knee, you know, a pretty girl who wouldn't want to grab your arm. Um, but something that struck us and one of the reasons why we got interested in this whole investigation was there was an additional charge. In addition to be, being charged with falsely reporting a crime, she also was charged with a felony, an additional charge that would have meant an additional five or six years behind bars. Could you talk a little bit about what that charge was? Because it just seemed so extraordinary. Yeah, I think without that charge, I probably wouldn't have even been interested in talking to Nikki, but I was like six years. Wow. Okay. So what did she do? Um, so you heard it. I mean, she had the interrogation. She kind of broke down and was like, you know, gave what Cotto thinks is a full confession and you can decide yourselves what you think about that. Um, but then in addition to that, it was because she had just requested a rape kit and had gotten the rape kit. And that was, that amounted to tampering with evidence. Um, even though she hadn't touched it, she hadn't done anything to it. She lied to the nurse by presenting herself as a rape victim. And I thought, wow, that's really troubling. Um, that, you know, in addition to feeling like, I don't know if I want to report or not, if you are, you know, go, if you go through this now you have to decide, well, do I want to get a rape kit? Because if they don't believe me, then, Maybe that's just another charge they're going to tack on to, you know, to what, you know, if they arrest me. So, yeah, that's why I started looking into that. And I just felt like all the media coverage was like not zeroing in on what really mattered, which was like, wow, OK, this is setting a really troubling precedent. Now, speaking is this still oh. so speaking of press coverage, you know, we both work at the Center for Investigative Reporting. Holler. Um, uh, and but thank you. But one thing that that um, it, I know that you found in doing your reporting was the role that the press has in in elevating some of these cases, um, you know, because once someone is uh, has been um, charged with false reporting, they're no longer considered a victim. They don't have the right to privacy. But so what what role do, do newsrooms and the press have in, in kind of perpetuating this? And, and what can we do better? I think that, like, for example, for Emma, as you saw, while she was in jail, the first article went out and like that was just like her mom was so mad, which you can understand why the mom was like, how did that journalist even know? Like, you know, just to get an arrest report that quickly. Um, so I don't know. It's, I, I've never worked, uh, you know, granted I've never worked at a local news shop. So I know like breaking news is very hard and yeah, you're, you're accustomed to doing things a certain way. And I just challenge reporters to really ask yourselves, is this something I need to do? Is this something that the public needs to know about? Because I might be outing someone who's actually a victim and that's unethical to do. Um, it, it just is. So if, if that person hadn't been charged, you wouldn't name them, but now you're just choosing to believe what the police write in their report and basically publish sort of the police report, which without doing your own investi investigating. And that was really troubling to me. And it hurt Emma so much. It hurt Diane so much. They were, um, they would get messages, they would get text messages. I mean, it was awful what they went through and that wouldn't have happened if the press didn't publish their name, if the police didn't publish the name on Facebook. So that is another step of a viol, like that's just another violation that they went through and it's not necessary at all. One of the things that we spent a lot of time thinking about was really, um, how to show that this problem was systemic. It was happening nationwide. It wasn't just 
you know, a, a police officer here and there. Um, you know, Ray collected media reports and found more than 200 in almost every state. Um, but she also spent a long time doing the case analysis that you see in the film, um, where, where she eventually got 52 cases and, and really was able to dig into the patterns and get a better idea of, of how this was happening. And one thing I feel like isn't clear is how difficult it was to get a hold of those case reports. It was really a needle in a haystack and took and took a whole team of researchers years. So I was wondering if you could talk about that, how you guys did that. Mm -hmm. It's not as visual. <laughs> so that's probably why I did, it's not in the documentary, but it did take so many records requests, so many um, people and researchers to like read through them because um, we started off with all the false reports, which means like I am getting like in 2020, there are all the Karens and Kens <laughs> um, who were like, you get it. Like they're calling, you know, because the kids are too loud and it's like, that's a waste of police time. Yeah. Like, don't do that. But I needed to sift through like all those things and then like find the ones that related to sexual assault and rape. Um, and yeah, so that just took so long. And then so many of these records we got were not complete or they didn't have all the information they needed. That was, I, I think it was like a three year process, some, like several years. Um, and I think it was worthwhile because without it, I don't, there's really no way for me to say like, here's the pattern, you know? And I didn't want to use media reports because I was already coming with a certain level of like sensationalism. And so these were just like, most of these reports were never publicized. So I thought that that was important to do. And yeah, and I hope that that, you know, registered for people. There is like that graphic on screen and the one that really like gets me so agitated is that, you know, a quarter of those cases were solved in less than a day. And I just kept thinking, I'm like, how could you possibly like, so someone comes to you, they say they've been assaulted and like hours later, you're like, no, like I'm positive that they made it up. It's just, that was so troubling to me. Um, so I'm glad that we had that finding and I hope it like sinks in for people. One of the questions I've gotten when people have watched the film um, is why, <laughs> why is this happening? Why are police pursuing these charges and how, how can this stop or how can this be prevented? What do you say? So like Carl gives an answer in the film. He's like, well, they, they want to get the cases off their desk. I think that's part of it. Um, and then, but then I can't help but wonder, well, I mean, they get it off their desk, but then they're also like, having to go back to court again and again, if this person, you know, fights the charge, it's just a lot of work still. And then I talk to other detectives and they tell me, oh, it's because police really don't like it when you lie to them and technically it's a crime. So they're going to go after you. Um, and I said, okay. Um, and then also I saw whenever cases like these were published, the public really supported the police in that in that choice. They were, they were like, good job. Like you got one, like, thanks, you know? And so it was just so weird to like see all of this. And, and yeah, I think it all plays together. It's, it's very, um, yeah, it's like, it is a systemic problem. And so there's many things playing into it. Um, so I do think it is complex and I don't think there is a simple answer to it. Um, but experts like Lisa Avalos would say training really would help. Um, I don't think it would necessarily like fix everything, but I think it certainly would help. I did see that as another pattern was that these officers, I was listening to them talk to these people and I'm like, that is not at all best practices. Like never heard of you asking a victim this or telling a victim, like this is wow. You know, suspect didn't want to be interviewed. So yeah, never mind. so I guess I'll just charge her because she confessed. I mean, yeah, like I just was so I was so surprised. And then and then, yeah, like Cotto did admit, you know, he has not had any training in how to do sexual assault investigations since the 90s. And like there's a lot that's changed since then. There's a lot of updates that he needs to learn. Um, so I do think that would be one element that helps. And beyond that, I think it's going to be like legislation maybe, but I do think there's a lot of smart people out there that are not me <laughs> um, and will, you know, think about this. And so I hope, I hope they do. We're going to open it up to the audience. Is there a microphone to go to people? Please wait. 
wait till the mic comes to you. We will not answer your There's question someone in the back. until you have a mic. I'm wondering if an important difference would be if there were women investigating and not these are all men that, that handle these, these uh, reports. That, that's a really good question. Thank you for bringing that up. Um, I have seen women detectives do it too. In fact, the two 12 year olds that were charged were um, charged by two female detectives. Uh, I don't know. It's, I think women hold the same rape myths that men do. I, I do not think that they're necessarily better because they're women. Um, you know, you hear this about jurors. It's like, a, a, you know, someone who's trying to prosecute a sex crime, they're careful about who's in the jury because female jurors tend to be more judgmental of a female victim than men are because lots of reasons, uh, psychological reasons. So yeah, I think that, I think that plays into it. I, I have to say, I don't, I'm not certain that that would ne help necessarily. It may not make it worse, but yeah. Any other questions? I don't know what you're going to do next, but I really, really appreciate beyond measure the teamwork that you've had and the fact that CIR stuck, reveal, stuck with you all for three years and found the funding for you to do this. It's absolutely transformational and breakthrough. Uh, I, I see I'm a feminist who's here to applaud because I know that it's a very complicated world. You all live in it yourselves in the investigative journalism field. And it, this is a fantastic breakthrough for all of us. We're very grateful. I have no question. I have only appreciation. Thank you. And it is true that we had a question down here. It is true that we would not have been able to do this work in any way, shape, or form without the support we had at the Center for Investigative Reporting to give us the time to dig into this investigation. Ray actually was working on many other stories, pursuing this in the meantime until, you know, until she had enough to kind of work on it full time. She had the benefit of some incredible veteran reporters um, to to draw on and to and, and to learn from. And we had some incredible editors, you know, data journalists, and it takes a village. It took so many people to to make this happen. And and there are very few places that, you know, are like CIR and do this kind of work. I I am not going away. I keep telling my sources that because I, I do. There's several cases that I can't shake because um, they're so just troubling. And so, yeah, they're, they're not in the film necessarily. They're not in my the radio piece that I did. Um, so I I think I'll keep going for as long as I can stand it. Um, yeah, I'm very curious. We'll see what what the reaction is like if people want to hear more about this, like if they can stomach it and actually like do something about it, I would, I would be fine with keeping on working on this because I really care about it. Yeah, just a fantastic case of investigative journalism. So thank you very much. Very impactful. I was curious, at what point did your process decide, hey, this would be a great documentary? And how did shooting a documentary as you're doing in the investigative journalism kind of change the process or enhance the process for you? So Amanda was on this with me from the very beginning. So at first it was like, I have this case. It's kind of like weird. And then, you know, we thought it would be one story. Um, and then I feel like it was Emma that really transformed that for me. Cause when I met her and I talked to her, she had short little pixie cut and like maybe one tattoo. And she was really like, I don't know, just I could see her just finding her way how to talk about this still. And I saw her every time I talked to her, she just sounded different and like had more, um, like she had done so much reflection. Uh, and so when I met her, I thought, oh, okay. Yeah. Like you can tell your story and you got this, like you can hold this. Um, then yeah. And then I kept meeting other people and the interrogation footage, that was like, I don't know what we would do without that. I mean, sadly, people need to see it to believe it. Um, and that was really powerful for me, too, because I would read the police report and I'm like, that's not what she said <laughs> or that's not the context, like in the right context that you're giving. Um, so, yeah, I that's I feel like she changed things for me. And the, it, originally it wasn't envisioned for Ray to be in the film, actually. You know, uh, journalists don't really like to <laughs> 
talk about themselves or ha put themselves forward. But um, but when we brought the film to Netflix, they were saying that you have all of these disparate cases. And she was really the one element going through. And we realized this following her reporting. She would call advocates or uh, experts, law enforcement, and they they weren't aware of all of these other cases. Like she she was the, the spoke kind of with everything around it. And and they wanted to show that unfolding process of her investigation. And after some thought, Ray <laughs> agreed <laughs> to to uh, be in the film. But that was that was definitely a very different transformative part of the process. One more question here. Question. Is someone over here? Oh, I'm sorry. Hi. sorry. No, sorry. that's okay. Sorry, I should stand up. Hello. Um, <clears throat> sorry, I have something caught in my throat, so I'm going to try and get through this really quickly. That was really wonderful and really upsetting, but I'm so glad to be aware of the issue. And I'm wondering if you're aware of any advocacy groups on the other side that are educating young women about their rights in these scenarios and these techniques, sort of the way that self-defense classes can have a huge impact at that age? That is a very good point. I am, I am not aware of people like educating anyone specifically on like, Hey, you could be charged. Here's what you can do to protect yourself. But there are absolutely like, I met some incredible advocates who are in the room when they're being interviewed. And I do think that makes a difference a lot of the time, not every time, but I do think it helps a lot. If you have someone there with you, um, Emma was by herself, Diane was by herself, Nikki was by herself. So I do think that was like another theme I noticed. Um, I, yeah, I think that's another like tool that we could, you know, that someone could use the film for. Um, and we're definitely thinking about like how to do that. We have an impact campaign we're working on that I think could be great, really helpful. And, um, yeah. And so, yeah, I, I don't know. It's, it's very, I've thought about this too. I'm like, what advice would I give to anyone? And it's such a personal decision if you're going to report or not to begin with. And if you are, I do think you should know what can happen to you. Sadly. Um, I think all of us should go into pretty much every police interaction, very skeptical, um, based on what I've seen. And, um, yeah, yeah. I wish there was more out there. So the film will be on Netflix starting May 23rd. So <laughs> well so you're getting a sneak peek before the world. So uh, we'd love to engage you if you thought the film was worth, worthwhile, if you enjoyed it, if you think it's important, please spread the word in your network. We really want this to get out to uh, the widest possible audience and you know, we're hoping for some real world impact around it. Oh, thank you thank for coming. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>